Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our fourth event of the series on Science vs. the Bible. Tomorrow night is our last, and if you're able to come, we'll be glad to see you again. And if you can bring somebody, that will be a bonus. We trust the information that is going to be presented will be of value to you during your life and through eternity. And if that is the case, it will be a good investment for your time this evening. <clears throat> now, just a few preliminaries. Every exit is a fire exit. There are five of them. So, uh, just aim for the nearest door if the alarm goes off. Uh, we do have a number of booklets and pamphlets that are free on the table here. There's a little booklet called Is It True? Evidence for the Bible. And it reflects on archaeological evidence that demonstrates the record of the Old Testament especially is precise and accurate. Just this week somebody was saying to me <laughs> that there's no evidence for anything in the Bible. And I referred them to this booklet and a few other historical documents to show that that wasn't true and that they actually had obviously never read the book. And we will find that most of the critics of the Bible have really never turned to the subject matter that they are trying to oppose. And we're going to think a little bit about that this evening. Now, if you have a mobile phone, we'd be glad if you could put it onto silence. Um, and uh, we're now going to kick into the subject matter. We're looking at the, the science verse the Bible. I want to go into detail more so tomorrow night on that subject, just to, con to show the differences between science and the Bible, and how the, there is elements that is called science, such as evolution, which is really philosophy. And we're going to dig into those details tomorrow. Uh, but tonight I want to run through just one principle, which my next slide will refer to. Um, but the underlying objective here is to look at the purpose of life and where does it all end. And this first part of our session tonight, the first 25 minutes or so, will focus on the purpose of life. And in the second half of our meeting, we'll touch on the subject of where does it all end. Now, my name is Paul Didcot. I am a senior consultant. I worked for telecom management consultancies for nine years. And the last 16, I went back into industry, working with mobile phone and telecom manufacturers. Um, I've been a director of two companies. And I'm currently a director of the Mobile Wireless Forum, which constitutes all the leading mobile phone manufacturers in the world. And uh, we focus on the subject of mobile phone human exposure to radiation. Um, the third of the, the group are scientists. Um, now, my wife and my family didn't know that, so that's the first time I've told them that information. Now, the question comes, design without intelligence. Can you get design without intelligence? Can you have creation without a creator? Can you have design without a designer? Can you have pattern without a planner? Now those are very essential questions for us and uh, it helps us to understand the answer to those questions. But first of all we need to ask ourselves, what do we believe? What do you believe? What do I believe? Supposing this bowl, it looks like it's handcrafted, were to turn up in your garden one morning, uh, <clears throat> what would you think about it? You probably thought somebody lobbed it over the fence and that may well have happened. But it would it enter your mind the possibility that that bowl, a simple vessel of wood, we presume it was handcrafted, could it possibly have arisen by chance, by coincidence, natural coincidence? You know, we would never even think that way. Now, we're going to think about the logic of that in a moment. Now, what if a chair materialized in our front room? We came downstairs one morning, we found a chair we'd never seen before there. Likewise, we would, never, we would never presume for one second it could have materialized of its own ability and of its own accord. It has pattern, it has plan, it has a design, and it is a creation of some form. And we, we know that it would have been made by a designer, a creator, a planner. Now the question comes, what do evolutionary scientists really believe 
in relation to this question, design without intelligence. And this takes me to a subject that I'm calling the SETI project. Back in 1982, when I started at Bristol University, all the computer screens were green, and uh, when they were sitting idle, they were not actually sitting idle, they were processing data. And they were linked to the SETI pro project, which was running from Harvard back in those days. It's moved around a bit, and uh, it's um, uh, now in California. There's a separate SETI institute in California. And uh, what they do is they basically have a number of big antennas, and they are picking up radiation from space, and they're analyzing that radiation to see if there's a pattern or a code or some form of modulation to indicate there may be extraterrestrial life. And that's what SETI stands for, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Now, by definition, the people that run the SETI project are not creationists. Typically, they wouldn't be Christians. They are invariably evolutionary scientists and uh, uh, many of them would be atheists. The, the SETI Institute today has over 200 scientists in it and most of them would be evolutionary scientists. So what do they believe when it comes to intelligence uh, and design? Well, as I say, back in 82, the computer screens that where I, when I was at Bristol University were green and they were running these traces backwards and forwards and there's all this noise, noise spikes running as the trace ran backwards and forwards and there was so much data being picked up from these antennas that they were, they were harnessing the power of the computers around the universities in the world to process the data to try to discover patterns that might indicate extraterrestrial intelligence. This screenshot is of a more modern computer and it has a color trace and it's processing the data and this is an example of what would have been on the screen uh, a few years ago at least. Now, they, they, uh, this has been running for over 40 years since I was at university in Bristol and they haven't come across any significant intelligence since. But they did come across something that was of excitement to them back in 1977 and they called it the WOW signal. It was so impressive to them that the, uh, the astronomer that discovered it, Jerry Amon, wrote next door to the trace, WOW! It was so exciting. And it was picked up by the uh, State Ohio State University radio telescope Big Ear in uh, 1977 and as he was trawling through the print off, the paper print offs, he came across a certain signal that he was so impressed by, he wrote those letters WOW next door to them. The entire sequence lasts 1 minute and 12 seconds, quite a long time in terms of the data, uh, a, a pattern of data from space. They've never detected a signal like it since, and there's been various hypotheses as to what caused it. It came from a source near Sagittarius, which is a low to the horizon, near one of the largest stars in the universe called Arcturus. And, uh, and uh, it remains the strongest candidate for alien radio transmission ever detected. Now this is interesting for a number of reasons. One is, they aren't finding anything. Now creationists aren't surprised because we understand that the Bible is God's word for us today. It tells us what we're here for why we're here and where we're going and where we came from. Science cannot do that. Philosophy tries to do it, but the Bible does do that. And uh, the Bible tells us that man was made uh, for the primary purpose for, uh, for God, for, for the worship of God and for the praise of God. And we're going to see that in a moment. And we, do, we know there is extraterrestrial life out there. We know there are angels. Fallen angels and holy angels, and we know that God is out there, and we have that revelation through the scripture. We don't need to search. But let's go back to the wow signal. This on the left hand side is the data that, um, let me try the pointer, see if it works. Did a minute ago. Um, there we go. 
So um, the data that was printed off is just a series of ones. Ones, if you go to the right hand chart, you'll see this, the ones represent the lowest signal level. Zero is the noise floor. So anything that is above the noise floor could be a signal. And all of a sudden they found this, uh, this data and uh, it's coded in letters. In fact, it's, it follows the letter 6, E, Q, U, J, 5. And 6 is the number 6, uh, just here. That's the first data point. And E is 15 times the noise floor. And uh, Q is at 26 times the noise floor. And U is at 30 times the noise floor. That's the highest point in the signal. Then it starts to drop off down to J at 20 times, and then finally down up to the point 5, 5 times the noise floor. And it was a sudden burst of energy that was outstanding. And after, therefore they wrote, wow, next door to it. Now, there's a common misconception that the wow signal contains data. Some form of communication, but it doesn't. It's just an unmodulated continuous wave signal with no encoded data. That's all it is, just an energy pulse. In fact, that, uh, that uh, source where it came from, near Sagittarius, is next door to the center of our universe. And uh, nobody knows what could have caused it, but then again, it could have been anything. There's, there's really no evidence that it came from aliens. But if the scientists were so excited about a sudden energy burst that they wrote wow next door to it and they documented it and chronologued it and held it up as the most significant indication there might be intelligent life out there, what would they do if they received a signal like this? This is just data signals that couldn't be processed by various electronic equipment. But if you see the second line, Imagine there was a power burst of energy that rose and dropped off to the noise floor and then rose again and held its level and then dropped off and it rose again uh, and you can put that sort of signal through a, a signal analyzer and convert it to, to ordinary binary computer code. And it would likely indicate there is an intelligent source out there trying to communicate with us. I don't think they would have written wow next to signals like this. They probably would have written Eureka and got excited, extremely excited about what they had observed. Now, supposing they saw a signal like this. This is a single strand of, uh, of DNA, a double helix strand of DNA. It's an uh, artistic representation. David was looking at DNA yesterday and referring to the complexity of it. And imagine there was some way that this sort of level of complexity of data was processed through the, through the, the airstream and uh, received by an antenna. They would be ecstatic in the extreme. It would certainly indicate there was intelligent life forms trying to communicate with us. Bill Gates, the founder of a computer empire, said that DNA is a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. And it exists in every single living cell within our bodies. Now, is this chance or is it intelligent design? Remember, intelligent scientists seeing a burst of energy from space get excited because they know that you cannot get a pattern without a planner. You cannot get design without a designer. You cannot have creation without a creator. They know that. And I think uh, we know it too. And if they received data this complex, they would be absolutely certain it was indicating an intelligent life source. Now, just a little bit of detail on DNA. It's a complex subject. I don't know too much about it. But DNA in our cells is packaged into 46 chromosomes in the nucleus. And uh, it's super coiled using enzymes that take up a very small amount of space. In fact, DNA, that was a single strand 
of DNA that we showed you on the previous slide, it's actually multiple strands, coiled upon coiled upon coiled, wound together, and uh, there are over there are about three million base pairs in each human cell, and it fit with, would fit into six microns, a very small measurement, a fraction of a millimeter. And if you stretched out that DNA and unraveled it, it would be two meters long. That's how much DNA we have in every single cell in our body. And all the DNA in all the cells put together would be about twice the diameter of the solar system. I once read that there's more data in the DNA of a single human being than in all the computer systems in the world. Now, it would be ludicrous to suggest that the computer systems in the world, the data in the computer systems in the world came around by chance. Natural coincidence. And it's, it's, it's even more absurd to suggest that our DNA came around by chance. I trust that that is very clear to us this evening as we examine these elements. Now, this is a better representation of DNA, multi-strands. It's absolutely wonderful in its complexity. Scientists haven't fully cracked DNA, and it's very doubtful that they will. And this is, again, just an artistic representation. Coil upon coil. Now, is it chance or is it intelligent design? And now, I want to run through a number of examples. It was a presentation I came across a few years ago, and I just want to run through them because it really conveys the same message and presents to us the evidence of a creator uh, all around us in nature. This is the cockpit of Concord. It's in Manchester, I think it's in a museum in Manchester. If, if you go to RAF Concord, <coughs> Uh, our uh, museum, you can actually go into a development unit of Concord and see all this sort of uh, telemetry equipment. And it takes, it must have taken well over a thousand individuals to develop this machine. The scientists that discovered Ohm's law and Volt and Amps and Coulombs and then that designed the instrumentation and the cabling and the signaling systems and then the, 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 the manufacturers of the product and the assemblers of the product. It takes incredible genius, technology and wisdom to build an incredible design like this. And I don't think anybody would doubt that. And if someone said that the aircraft and its cabin were not planned, it just existed, it came about by itself, by chance or by natural coincidence, what would you think? <laughs> they would be observed. So how would, how would you react? How would the engineers that designed it and the scientists that made it react? Now what about these? A shoal of tropical fish. A butterfly with transparent wings. Some exotic swallows and a little fluffy kitten. The fish in their natural habitat, perfectly designed for their environment. You, you won't have time to go into the, the uh, elements of, of the fish. The swallows, there's a whole range of different types of swallows I discovered when I looked at this picture. I'm not sure which, which these are, probably Asian. A butterfly, its wings are made up of thousands upon thousands of feathers. If you catch one, let it go. The little specks on your hand are minute feathers. Every single one in its order. So that the, the uh, Red Admiral produces Red Admirals, and the peacock butterfly produces peacock, and it's all encoded in the DNA. And the fluffy kitten, lovely little creatures, far more complex in themselves than the cockpit of Concord. We say that this is creation, but the evolutionist, the atheistic evolutionist says, the human muscular system is natural coincidence. Is that reasonable? A robot with just a few moving joints. And you look at the, the anatomy of a human being. Uh, a few years ago I was in Piccadilly Circus and there's a museum there where a, uh, a German doctor by the name of uh, Gunther von Hagen has taken their people, he's taken their skin off and he's coated them in plastic and they look like this. They're, they're, uh, they've they've uh, been soaked in resin and uh, they're set in statue in different postures. The one I saw was playing basketball. Very strange. 
a bit horrifying, but amazing. Just to look at it, amazing. And the way the muscles wrap around your joints, and uh, in a perfectly functional way to give the correct lift and movement so that our arms are completely rotational is incredible. And this, as we were learning yesterday, is only one of the seven systems of the human body. Some say this occurs by natural coincidence. But can we see that that is absurd? A circuit board. This is a video image, a video and imaging a digital processor on a multi-layer circuit board. Capacitors and thick film, resistors, etc. Complex design. But what about the human brain? Is it natural coincidence or was it designed? We see a, uh, a flight of airplanes, creation we say, we know they were designed, they were created. <clears throat> but what about a flight of geese? A camera, multi-lens, SLR camera, uh, zoom camera will focus the object from a multi-range multi, multi of distances uh, onto its sensor to take the image. We know if we ever saw a camera that it was designed by intelligent beings. But what about the human eye? Incredible flexibility in focusing from very long distances beyond any single lens camera to a closeness that no single lens camera can achieve. In fact, the image is inverted as the, as the um, picture shows us here, a little wine glass is upside down. You didn't maybe know that, but your brain turns the image back up the right way and you see it the right way. And if you put on glasses that turn uh, the image back the other way, after a while your brain turns it around again. That's what scientists have done. Incredible how the brain does that. We see a robot hand. When I was in the University in Bristol, one of the technicians built an aluminium arm for a robot and it was very clever. It could pick up an egg. The guy who made it won a bet. It, it couldn't, somebody said it couldn't do it, and it did, very clever. This wouldn't be able to do it, it doesn't have sensors in the fingers. But you can see it's been designed by intelligent beings. What about the human hand? The robot hand cannot feel pressure, it cannot feel temperature. It doesn't have the flexibility or dexterity of a human hand. Did it come around by chance, natural coincidence, or design? A small aeroplane. Propeller, prop plane, creation. What about the bald eagle? Incredible creatures. I've seen them flying on the Mississippi. Beautiful birds and uh, spectacular creatures demonstrating the glory of the Creator. A spectacular firework display. We say creation because there's pattern, there's plan. What about the Aurora Borealis? in the Northern Hemisphere. You go up to Iceland, you'll see spectacular pictures like this. It's like corrugated iron. It ripples. And it, the colors change. It's absolutely spectacular. And it lasts a lot longer than any firework display that has been run on Earth. <clears throat> Beautiful creation. A robot head. <clears throat> Plastic, encapsulated skull, eyes with sensors that can see. It can move a little bit. We know that's creation. What about our heads? What about the, the beauty of the, of the human form? <clears throat> Natural coincidence? A building, a domestic house, a habitation for human beings, we know it was created. What about the earth? The habitation of mankind, just the exact distance from the sun. <laughs> Any closer, you know, if the, the, the uh, environmentalists are concerned, if the average temperature of the earth rises by two centigrade, it becomes catastrophic. And if we were 1% closer to the sun or further away, life on earth would be unsustainable. There's much we could say about that, but we don't have the time. <clears throat> but uh, the oxygen, the water, the rain, the soil, the seeds, germination, the sun, all there to sustain life for us. Natural coincidence or indicating intelligent life. Van Gogh's, Vincent Van Gogh's sunflowers, famous painting, well drawn, but nothing like the original thing. Who made it? Who designed it? A soft toy and living soft toys, cuddly kittens and a cat. Natural coincidence or design? A light bulb. 
designed by Thomas Edison. You see, a light bulb, you know it didn't come around by chance. It was designed by intelligence, intelligent people. What about the sun? The exact distance from the earth as we've just been reflecting. A jump jet harrier, creation. What about a hummingbird? Incredible creatures, hummingbirds. I'm not exactly sure what this one is, but it's very similar to the amethyst woodstar hummingbird. The amethyst woodstar hummingbird has a green belly, but it otherwise looks identical. It has the fastest normal wing beats of any bird at 4,800 revs per minute, 80 beats per second. The red-throated goes up to 12,000 revs per minute. That's more. That's, that's twice the speed of most car engines. Incredible little creatures. Phenomenal. Natural coincidence or creation? Let's pause for a moment. Now I borrowed those slides, I inserted them into mine, and at this stage there will be background clapping, which I muted because I didn't want to play. But it says, our thankfulness and praise to the great artist, the supreme intelligence, the prime reason for everything. As the Bible says, Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created. Now what is the purpose of life? Why did God create us? Psalm 117 verse 1 and 2 tells us, O oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations, praise Him, all ye people. God wants us to praise Him. He wants us to look at His creation. He wants to look at our own design. He wants us to appreciate it. He wants us to praise Him. That's one of the primary purposes for our existence. That's what we've got on this sheet. What is the purpose of life? And where does it all end? One of the primary purposes is that we might praise God. Now, Psalm 117 verse 1 is the shortest, cha shortest chapter in the Bible. And in those two verses, it summarizes the essence of life, the purpose of life. But Psalm 103 verse 1 and 2 is the center verse of the Bible, center two verses. And it conveys the same message. Bless the Lord, praise God, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. You know, there's a book called The Selfish Gene. I haven't read it. It's an evolutionary book, but it's certainly true in its title. Humans are inherently selfish. How many days pass when we fail to give thanks to the Creator that made us, gave us a life to live, a breath to breathe? We live life focused on our phones, and we never look at nature all around us, the beauty of nature, the glory of this planet. If you went on the internet, you can search these things. You can use the internet to good effect. And there are many spectacular things that you will cause us to praise God. The purpose of life, as the Bible tells us. Science doesn't tell us the purpose of life. Philosophers try to tell us in their conflicting theories. The Bible does tell us. What's the conclusion? SETI evolutionists have reason to believe. The least coding received from space would indicate the existence of an intelligent designer of extraterrestrial life. So why do we choose to ignore the incredibly complex design in every single cell in our bodies, in our DNA, throughout the whole universe, evidence of a creator? The Bible says in Psalm 19 verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth His handiwork. That is a universal testimony. The whole of the universe, the heavens all around us, the Milky Way, the galaxy that we're in, declares the glory of God. And God wants us to appreciate that and praise Him for it. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. That's 24 hours a day. Every single day, every single night, there is speech being spoken and knowledge being shown of the existence of the Creator. And it says there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. What does that mean? Universal language. Doesn't matter what language we speak, whether our native language is Punjab or Hindu or whatever. <clears throat> Everyone on earth can read the language of heaven, the space around us that speaks to the testimony of the Creator. It says their line has gone out through all the earth. That message, the sentences that they proclaim, is gone out through all the world and their words to the end of the world. What does that mean? It's heard by everyone. No
No wonder Psalm 14 verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. And someone will say, Well, what about Richard Dawkins? What about David Attenborough? Brilliant men, clever men. They actually are both on record as saying that they're not sure if there is a God. They're actually not atheists. Dawkins is on record. You'll find a video on YouTube with him saying on the BBC that he's not an atheist. He's not sure, but he's not an atheist. The fool has said in his heart. Now, many people will say with their lips, there's no God. You know what they're doing? They're trying to convince themselves. But when they say it in their heart, they really mean it. And when they say it in their heart, God says of them, they're fools. We've got the testimony of heaven itself, of the creation of Orlando's, testifying to God. Now, we've only got a few more slides, but I want to get to this, the problem. We have 33 slides in total. We're only speaking to about 32 of them. The problem, the first problem we have is that as soon as we recognize there must be a creator God, we must recognize, firstly, that we're accountable to Him. That He created us with a purpose. And if He created us with a purpose, He wants us to know His purpose. And if He wants us to know His purpose, He must have revealed His purpose. Where has God revealed His purpose? There's only one book that profoundly reveals the purpose of God, and that's the Word of God, the Bible. The Bible is God's answer book. He explains where we came from, what we're doing here, where we're we going, and it explains God's purpose for us. And those, most of the critics of it, almost all of the critics, have never read it. And they don't get the context. They take verses out of context. And, uh, and we can deal with that in the question time, if anyone has any questions, but that's a, a separate subject. The second problem is this. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've fallen short of God's standard. Sin came in. Romans 3.23. And sin separates us, and it will try and keep us. With the sin nature, it will try to keep us from coming back to God. That's the real reason why men are trying to prove there is no God, when they know in their heart of hearts, there must be. You cannot have design without a designer. You cannot have creation without a creator. You cannot have pattern without a planner. The evidence is all there, they know it. But they're trying to get away from reality. The Bible explains how we can get right with a holy and righteous God. The wages of sin is death, <laughs> but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now we're going to hand the meeting over to Andrew. Thank you for your attention. Please remain seated for our final presentation in the next 25 minutes. And uh, we're going to hear God's message for us today. And also, where does it all end?